Hello, I'm Tim Smolens, and today I'm going to analyze the ultra-sophisticated, complex, and utterly beautiful chord progression of one of the greatest songs of all time, God Only Knows by the Beach Boys. Please take a minute to help my little channel grow by subscribing below, hit the notification bell to say all, uh, leave comments, uh, and check out more videos on my channel. As most of you likely know, this tune is one of the crowning achievements of one of the most heralded albums in pop rock history, Pet Sounds by the Beach Boys. Paul McCartney was quoted as calling this song the greatest song ever written, and it just may be. Uh, it was written by Brian Wilson, who did the music and the melodies, and lyrics by Tony Asher. The lead vocal was done by Brian's little brother, Carl, who has a very beautiful and angelic voice and is one of the secrets of that Beach Boy vocal sound. Uh, the backing track is noteworthy for its unique instrumentation with a orchestral, baroque, pop sort of flavor. It features uh, French horns, accordions, clip-clop percussion, which is, I think, plastic orange juice cups uh, is what it says, um, multiple basses, we have harpsichord, sleigh bells, tambourine, flute, alto flute, clarinet, sparse drums, uh, string sections, muted tack pianos, and many of the instruments are run through the glorious echo chamber of Western Studios where it was recorded. That may sound like a lot of instruments, but the way, um, the way Brian has it is it sounds almost like sparse and beautiful because a lot of the instruments are playing the same part, so it just blends together. Um, it does not come across as, oh, listen to all those instruments. It's just a beautiful sort of otherworldly angelic pop timbre. It's unbelievable. Uh, the melody is one of the most gorgeous melodies that has ever been written, and the chords are absolutely stunning. They're filled with interesting progressions, uh, chord extensions, non-root bass notes, meaning like if it's a C chord, C is not in the bass. You might have a G or an E or a B flat or something else, uh, which is called an inversion. Uh, sneaky key changes uh, that are beautiful and insidious, parts that are in multiple keys at the same time, and a reluctance... Uh, a reluctance to ever hit the actual key center, which of this song is E, but he never just hits an E with an E in the bass, so you never quite get resolved. I think that uh, blends into the theme of the song, of this feeling of uncertainty, um, you know, kind of a, a love song, but, but there's definitely this feeling that, that the, the singer, the narrator, is never really settled, and I think that uh, the chord progressions follow that feeling, which is beautiful when you can have those aspects of your song align. Um, the chord progression is complex beyond belief, but this is not progressive rock. The complexity is subtle, and it lies in the chords and the melody and the instrumentation. Since complexity is not the point of Brian's music, the result to the listener is just beauty. The complexity only reveals itself when you take a look under the hood and start analyzing the chord progression and the key changes and how it seems to be in multiple keys at once and never really settles into the key center, which is E, you know, an E major. It never gets to that chord. Um, so we'll go through all of that and go through this, this, this chord progression that I really don't think there's a, a, another song that I can think of in pop music that is this complex and sophisticated in that regard. Most songs are, oh, it's an A, it starts an A, or at least it resolves, it ends up going to A. Um, yeah, w w wait till you see the way this one works itself out. But um, looking into what other music scholars have written in the past about this song and the immense difficulty of placing it in a key, I I'm relieved to know that it isn't just me that has found the answers less than concrete. Um, there's a certain ambiguity to the keys and such. Um, Brian said about the song, it's not really in any one key, it's a strange song, that's just the way it was written. It's the only song I've ever written that's not in a definite key, and I've written hundreds of songs. He said that in 2008. Um, someone else noted, and I'm reading this from Wikipedia, there's some cool uh, resources on there. Uh, God Only Knows contains a weak tonal center that is closest to E major, and in other sections, A major. Adding to this, almost all of the chords are inverted, meaning the root note is not in the bass. If it's an E chord, E is not in the bass. Uh, never really just plays a normal resolution of an E major chord that is not inverted. 
Um, someone else said, um, or in his book about pet sounds, Charles Granada writes that some of the musical devices that God Only Knows employs are usually rather ordinary by themselves. However, in this case, they were executed in a manner that was far more sophisticated than anything the Beach Boys or any other modern pop vocal group had done before. According to musicologist James Garrett, the tonal plasticity made the song innovative, not just in pop music, but also for the Baroque style it is emulating. He credits the sense of expansiveness evoked by the piece to this quality, emphasized by the disuse of authentic cadences and root position tonics. Lambert writes that a clear sense of key eludes the listener for the entire experience. That, in fact, the idea of key has itself been challenged and subverted. If anyone knows other tunes that have those characteristics, uh, comment in the post below, but I really don't know of any except a couple, a couple other Beach Boys songs. Okay, let's go through the song from the top and see what's actually going on here and analyze this chord by chord and key change by key change and see if we can figure out what's going on. Uh, if you do like this kind of content, I do have a conservatory called High Castle Conservatory on Patreon where we take real deep dives into music theory and music production and I uh, teach pretty much everything I know about that. So check that out if you can and I do have content all the way from beginner through advanced. All right, let's take the first three chords. A major, E over G sharp, meaning G sharp is in the bass, but it's an E chord, and F sharp minor seven. We've all heard these chords before. I confess that for the longest time, I thought this song was in A. Most songs start on the key that they're in, and this, these chords are all in A. And didn't even question it. I mean, there's so many weird chords in this song. I Okay, it's an A, and then he goes to all these other places. Who knows? I hadn't really looked at it until recently. Um, I ignored the French horn note, which goes C sharp. It goes C sharp, D sharp, E, not C sharp, D, E, which would be in the key of A. So the fact that it's C sharp, D sharp, E tells us we're in the key of E probably because these chords are all in the key of E also. A major's four, E over G sharp's one, F sharp minor's two, E over G sharp's one. So that's, it's a pretty simple beginning, although it's very deceptive because um, you see the key center is E here. I denote new keys by this sun, and it's new because it's the start of the song, so I call that a new key. But there's this little heart with an A. That's my way of saying it's unique to me. No, I haven't seen anyone else do that. It's not anything you'd see in college or anything. But um, it shows you it's flirting with the key of A. You know? It, it sounds like it could be an A except for that French horn note. Instead of, it's, so it's an E. So we get to the last time of the intro. Then it goes to this strange transition. Now I can analyze this in terms of key. I seriously doubt Brian was thinking in that way at all. Um, it's A over E, a B, which is the four of E. B over F sharp, which is the five of E, and then C over G, which is what you would call the flat six. It's not really in E, but it has the note E in it, which is why it works. So it's like a, they do that in uh, key changes sometimes with that flat six resolution, because it has the same note as the one. If E major, e, here's the note E, the note E fits in that C major chord, but like I said, this sounds more like a barbershop tag or, or the kind of thing Brian would do in that vein. So, you know, when he's coming out of it, it just sounds unique and funky and totally unexpected. I may not. Yeah, great transition. I, I'm going to have to use that somewhere with that kind of thing because I think that is cool and you don't hear anything like that. So. We get to verse one here, D over A. Now this is wild. Uh, right to a key change, and I know it's a key change because guess what? There's no D in an E major key. 
You could call it flat seven, but he's temporarily going into a different key here, whether he was thinking that or not. I may not always love you, but long. So anyway, on the surface, it might seem like it's in D. You could say, oh, maybe that's a, you know, a D to B minor, but it's a B minor six. There's no diatonic uh, minor six chord that you can make from the sixth degree of a scale. The only degree of a scale that can host a minor, minor six chord diatonically is a two chord. Um, it would be hard to explain why. If I'm in C major, because um, it's all white keys, we have C, D minor, E minor, F, G. If you look right here on the D minor, all white keys is C. You see it can host that six chord. Whereas if I go up to E minor, the E minor, there's no, no white key there. And then the A minor, another black key. So anytime you see a minor six, the only place in major that it truly fits in diatonically is on two. So this is funny. I mean, this is the same two chords that, uh, you know, Billy Joel starts, you know, uh, just the way you are. Don't go changing. Um, you know, D to B minor six. He doesn't put the A in the bass. But anyway, this is clearly an A. So what we have is a four in A with the A in the bass. So it makes it really kind of ambiguous and can't tell where the key is. A four to two. I may not always love you. Now for a little while, it's flirting with both E. I'm calling it a key change back to E, but you can see that little heart with the A. We're still flirting with that A key because F sharp minor is a two of E major, but it's a six of A. So this is where there's two keys going at once, but really clearly it's an F sharp minor, F sharp minor seven to a B seven, which is a classic sort of jazz two five, although it doesn't really sound like that because of that funky A in the bass. I mean, um, check that out. I may not always love you, the long as there are stars above you. If, if we didn't hit that A in the bass, it just sounds like this. The long as there are stars above. Instead, he puts that dominant seven in the bass and it creates so much beautiful tension. So we're back in the key of E there, still flirting with A, and we're doing a two five. And that's easy, we all understand what a two five is. Long. Ah. I may not always love you. So it's a four, two, and A. Then we switch the key of E and do a two, five. But long as there are stars above you. And finally, we get to E over B. Remember how we said this song's an E, but it never plays an E with E in the bass? We finally get to E, and what does he do? You'd never need to doubt it. Plays an E over B. So it, it doesn't make you think for one second we are in the tonal center. As long as there are stars above you, you'd never need to doubt it. Now what's going on here? We have E over B to C diminished chord. For those of you that know jazz and chord progressions well, we know that a diminished seven chord is extremely close to four different dominant chords. So the thing you always want to look for is the simplest progression. Even though the dominant means there's a degree of, I'm sorry, the diminished means there's a degree of ambiguity here, um, it is hinting at some d dominant chord. So if we're in the key of E, the most obvious dominant chord would be from its five, a B7. And there we go, we have a B7 with a flat nine, which means that um, we, we mean um, B7 flat nine, the flat nine would be C. If I lowered the C, we just have a B7. And he doesn't actually play any B in this chord. It's just a diminished. So I, what I'm saying is it is implying a B7 flat nine without really going to it. That's the beauty and the mystery of a diminished chord is you don't have to fully commit to calling it anything. But for our purposes of figuring out what function it's serving, what's happening here is it's going E over B, which is one, but over its, you know, E over B, it's one in the key of E, then five. Then E over B one, then the most beautiful chord ever. The mysterious half diminished chord. So a half diminished means the first part of the chord's diminished, but the but it doesn't have all diminished it. 
It goes a minor third up, a minor third up, and then a major third up, meaning it's half diminished. Fully diminished is this. Brian uses this chord to such great effect. So let's go through that again. E over B is finally, we're in the key of E, but he doesn't hit the E in the bass. You'd never need to doubt it. E over B. I'll make you so sure about it. Such a beautiful chord. So I'm calling that the flat five minor seven flat five, otherwise known as half diminished. That's the same thing. So it's his way of getting back to A. And most people, you know, go 5-1 or something to get back to A. He does this, you know, there's a little trick that Brian did back in the Girls on the Beach um, song way, way long ago, before, you know, the beginning of his career, where if I'm, if I'm in A, but I go a half step up and play a half diminished chord, B flat, C sharp, E, A flat, Look how close that is to an A major seven chord. One note, just the B flat comes down to A. So it's, it's incredibly close, uh, the same, they share the same middle of the chord, which is why that works. So, you never need to doubt it, I'll make you so sure about it. God only knows what I'd be without you. The other thing I will say about uh, half diminished chords or minor seven flat five, there's such an element of mystery to that chord. If you can learn how to use it, it's such a beautiful thing. Um, most jazz people know this, that a minor seven flat five is incredibly close to a dominant nine chord. And, and the way you know the little mnemonic is from the major third. So if, if I called this B flat the major third, um, or A sharp, B flat, it would be an F sharp nine chord. So F sharp nine chord, check it out, has a, a, a half diminished chord inside of it, there's just no F sharp. So you could say that, you know, in the key of E, this is functioning as a two dominant. And you wouldn't necessarily be wrong, except Brian's not using it that way here. There is no F sharp in his chord. You could call it F sharp nine over A sharp but I prefer to call it purely what it is, which is a minor seven flat five from the flat five of the key, which is a B flat. So you wouldn't be wrong to call it an F sharp nine over A sharp, but like I said, there's no F sharp in the chord, so I'm gonna be true to what Brian did there. So E over B, one. You never need to doubt it. Which is like a five chord, like a B seven flat nine, but it's really a C diminished seven. E over B. I'll make you so sure about it. Sorry, hard to sing those notes. God only knows what I'd be without you. Then the same transition. So that chorus, it's the same. A is not one, it's four of E. So going to the second verse, there's nothing different except the lyrics. If you should ever leave me, the laugh would still go on, believe me. The world could show nothing to me. So what good would nothing do me? God only knows what I'd be without you. Now Brian takes that idea of that little barbershop sort of tag I was saying, that little transition, and turns it into just it's probably the most unexpected transition I have ever heard in a pretty song. It's staccato, it's kind of jarring, and it has these really interesting chords, which I hope I don't mess them up. And it plays it twice, but it's faster than that, it's hard. Anyway, if we're going to analyze the chords, we have A over E, so we were already in E, so let's call that four. You know, in a way, it sounds like it sounds like it could be one of A, but we were already in A using A, so let's stay in E. So we have four, F sharp minor, which is two. Then we have G, so it's a key changer, or it's a, I don't know what you call it. It's not. It, there's no G in the key of E, so. It's as if we switch to the key of C major suddenly, which is what I called a G, then F over C, E minor over D, D 
minor over F, C over G, then D over A. And that D over A, I'm not gonna call one chord a key change, I'm gonna call it two major of C. All those chords are going on, and I seriously doubt, as I've said before, that Brian was thinking about key or key change in any of that. So I think what he's really doing is A, G, D is the, is the sort of outline of that. A, A, G, D. I really think that's the vibe of it, and then he just filled it in with all of these colorful chords. Really pretty. Uh, it sounds a little bit like some of the string voicings on I'm Waiting for the Day at the end of the song. So definitely uh, Brian Wilson, you know, speaking very clearly in his own harmonic language there. So we end on that, that D over A, which is interesting because that's the first chord of the verse, remember? I may not always love you. So we have... We end on that D over A, which is, yeah, the beginning of the verse. Now we go to the music from the verse, but the whole thing is up a fourth. And it's, it's instrumental. So it's the same theory as before, G over D, but we're actually in the key of D. So doing um, uh, four of D, then E minor six is two of D. Then we switch to the key of A and do a two five. That is one of the most amazing transitions in music because we're still up a fourth, right? The whole thing. Unbelievable. You're, you are not going to find a better moment in chord change history than that. Because for that, God only knows what I, um, we're up a fourth. And at the end of it, we hit the B minor seven. And that's really close to the D over A. We just lower the B to an A and we're at D over A, which is the original key. He just goes back into it effortlessly. There's no like transition or like uh, modulation that makes it like um, justifies it. He'd almost, as someone commented, um, a historian, he'd almost written himself into a corner there. Like, how do I get back to my original key? But he just takes that B minor seven and just lowers the bass note and he's back home in the original key as if nothing had happened. So we're up a fourth from the original key for that uh, instrumental break. Or, God only knows what I'd be without you right here if you should ever leave me the life would still go on believe me yeah I don't even know what to say about that that is just uh, look over that learn this chord progression it never fails to be one of those great moments in music history. So um, there's nothing really much else to go over. He settles back in and back to the chorus after that. goes to a little break uh, just the voice god only one voice and then a bunch of other voices come in just repeating the e or sorry the a e over g sharp f sharp minor seven to e over g sharp so that's the key of e four one two one so 
I really think the unbelievable part about Brian's music is how the complexity is not apparent to the to the listener, as I said before. It's just beautiful. It doesn't strike you like, oh, listen to that chord change. It's so amazing. It takes geeks like me to want to even look into that, and, and I'm not even sure why I do that. I do it because I want to understand it. I want to be able to, to understand what devices he employed, whether he did it on purpose or not, and then I like to keep all my devices in my back pocket of all the stuff I learned from different songwriters and be able to employ them in my own songs. You know, That's the same thing like learning, learning licks on the saxophone and then in jazz or blues and then incorporating them into the song. It's a, it's a, you know, music is a game of mimicry. There's, there's nothing new under the sun. You got to learn all the devices and then figure out how you can employ them in a unique way. So that is it for now. Um, thank you so much for listening. Uh, please subscribe below and please check out my Patreon. I'm going to be going much deeper in all kinds of stuff like this. If you like uh, exploring chord changes deeply, I'm only going to re be releasing some of my stuff on YouTube. So please come sign up. Um, and I will uh, get you going. We will, you'll have a great time. I promise. So take care. Thank you. <laughs>